Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Sunday morning service. It's become time for the message this morning. And uh, turn with me to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. That's the first book in the New Testament. Matthew 26. And we'll, be, and we'll pick up in verse 36. Matthew chapter 26, verse 36. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto his disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. Jesus was from the south. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then he saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Never, nevertheless, not as I will, but as I will. And he cometh unto his disciples, and he findeth them asleep. And he said unto Peter, What, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. We just sang that song just a few moments ago. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O my Father, if this cup may not pass from me except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples and said unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand. And the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, for this time. We pray that you bless your message. Strengthen our hearts through it. Lift us up through it. And help us to learn something, Lord God. And help us to receive it as you would have us receive it, Lord God. Help us not balk at the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, Lord. May we yield to it. May we yield to your word, Father. May we rejoice this morning in you. Uh, strengthen us, Lord God. Lift us up so that we may be uh, better ambassadors for Christ and better witnesses for Christ. We thank you, Father, for this time. We pray you bless it. Bless those who are online, those who are here, and those who will be listening to the message at a later time. May it be a blessing to our hearts. We thank you again, Father, and we'll give you all the glory and honor for what you do in our midst this morning. For unto you belongs worship glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. What we just read here was the, the day before the actual day of the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. What we read here transpired on the 14th day of the Jewish month of Nisan or Aviv, and many of you will immediately know that this is the day of the Passover. The Jews celebrated the Passover on the 14th of the month. And that uh, at the end of that day, right before the 15th day began, they would sacrifice the Passover lamb. And they would eat it on the evening of the 15th. And they would make sure that they would uh, burn everything in the morning. If anything was any leftovers, they would burn it up. Because that was what they were commanded by, uh, by, by God. So on this 14th day, what they would do is they would go into their homes and make sure there'd be no leaven in their homes. Anything that was leavened, uh, for example, the baking powder out the window, baking soda out the window, your dry yeast, your frozen yeast, and any bread, any cookies, anything that has any leaven in it, out the window. And today the Jews don't want to do that. So instead what they do is they have a special cupboard in their homes and they stack up everything in the cupboard and they tape that cupboard shut, thinking that they are keeping God's law. <clears throat> God says, nothing in your homes. But that's what they do. But on that 14th day, on that day, uh, Jesus was hoping <clears throat> that he would have the Passover meal with his disciples. But what happened is they never got to eat the Passover lamb because he was the Passover. Now the Lord's Supper is not the Passover. The Lord's Supper is the last meal he had on the 14th with his disciples. In Exodus chapter 34, 25, we are told that nothing would be left in the morning. <clears throat> Thou shalt not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leaven, Neither shalt thou sacrifice the feast of that, but of the Passover be left. Neither shall the sacrifice of the feast of Passover be left unto the morning. That is, what the typical Jewish custom was, custom was when they had the Passover meal, 
whatever was left of that land had to be burned. None of it would be left until the morning. And that would be the morning of the 15th. For that, for that is the day that Israel left the land of Egypt. Again, you read it again in Exodus 12, 10. And you shall nothing of it remain until the morning. And that which remaineth of it until the morning, ye shall burn with fire. Now we know from the events that unfolded that day, as we said again, that they never had a chance to kill the Passover lamb. Because it was destined by God's will and decree that Christ would be that Passover lamb on that day. Because Jesus was taken that night, he was tried, he was beaten, he was crucified, and he was buried. But that night on the 14th, remember the Jewish day begins on the evening. The Jewish day does not begin at our day at midnight. It began at around roughly sunset. When the sun went down, that's when the new day began. Their day began with the evening. And that night they gathered, they gathered around the table and they, what we call, they had a meal. And that, this meal that they had we call the Lord's Supper. Uh, Jesus and his disciples after that meal went into the garden of Gethsemane. Now Christ knew that his death was near and he retreated into deep prayer that night and he prayed with great agony requesting from the Father that this cup pass from him. Jesus prayed three times and he asked the Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But every time he prayed, he showed his willingness to obey the Father and to do the Father's will. For every time he prayed, he said, not as I will, but as thou will. Now, Jesus knew what the Father's will was, but as a man, he struggled with it. As a man, he, his desire was that he forego this, this cup that he was supposed to drink. How do we know that was his desire? Because that's what he prayed for. If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But he submitted himself to the Father's will, for he knew it was the Father's will that he drink this cup. He knew it was, it was the Father's will that he get on the cross and die for the sins of the world. So you may ask yourself, and many may ask you, yourselves, what is this cup that Jesus is referring to? Have you ever asked yourself, what cup is he supposed to drink? In Mark 10, 38, we have the answer. But Jesus said unto them, you know not what ye ask. Can ye drink of the cup that I drink of? This is several days before his crucifixion. And be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. Here in Mark 10, 38, we call this the baptism of the cross. This baptism Jesus speaks of is the suffering that he would endure on the cross as God took the cup of his wrath and he poured it upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about that. God poured his wrath upon his own son so that you and I wouldn't have to go to a place called hell and pay for it ourselves. And based on what we've read so far and other passages of the scriptures, uh, you would agree with me that Jesus found what he was, was, what he was about to do a hard thing, would you not? Would you not agree with me that him going on the cross would be a hard thing? You know, the same can be said about us. At times, it's not easy to carry out God's specific will for your life. And the title of our morning's message is, It's Not Easy. As Christians too, do you know, <clears throat> do you know that we have been baptized into the death of Christ? That we are to be dead to the world and sin no longer has no power over us. You can read that in Romans chapter 6. In Philippians chapter 3 verse 10, the Bible says, Paul says this. He says that I may know him. Now, many Christians, and I'm not trying to belittle you or to downplay your, your knowledge of the scriptures, but I do want to point out how many of you meditate on this verse that Paul wrote here in Philippians chapter 3 verse 10, and he says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made, being made conformable unto his death. Have you ever meditated what that really means for you and I? The agony, there, as you mature as a Christian, one of the things thing you'll find out is that you're going to fight your flesh. There's an agony of resisting the flesh that is foreign to the modern Christian. Today, everybody wants to feel good. I want to feel good. Uh, give me a message that makes me feel good, uh, Pastor. Uh, I don't want you to tell me that God wants something for me. 
I don't want you to tell me that God ex expects me to suffer, to agonize over my flesh, to fight this flesh. What are you, what are you talking about? I want, I want to be on easy street. I want to have an easy life. The Christian's agony comes from realizing that your sinful flesh refuses to bow down to, to God. Your sinful flesh will refuse to respond to the requirements of God for your life. And this is why you cannot bring yourself to even do the general will of God. I am, I am flabbergasted at those Christians who can't even endure the slightest discomfort for God. And the Bible tells us the flesh does not want to do the things of God. And if you keep giving into it, the harder it will be for you to defeat it. it it's always, when you want to get on a get well program, it's very hard to do. Um, my doctor has been getting on my case now for the last year, and she says the only way, and I'm being honest with you, that's what she tells me. I don't know if she's online now, but maybe she'll listen to the message later on and call me up and say, why did you say this? But I'm going to say it anyways. Uh, she's been on my case for the last year, and she says the only way you're going to lower your blood pressure is if you get on the treadmill. And she's on my case over and over and over again. Finally, I got tired of listening to her. I mean, I've known her since we were teenagers. So I finally get on the treadmill and guess within several weeks of the treadmill, what happens to my blood pressure? <laughs> but you know it's hard? You know getting on the treadmill, it's hard? Mm -hmm. Starting to run, uh, your, your hips are saying, what are you doing to me? Your brain is saying, uh, I want to I wanna eat a, a bag of Doritos. <laughs> Some of you will get that. I want a donut, I want a cake, I want coffee. I can't have, I can't have these things. That's the flesh. It detests when you put it under subjection. Your flesh does. Your flesh wants easy street. Your flesh wants to sit on the couch and have the, the, the life of ease. You've heard me mention several times that as Christians we ought to serve God and we ought to be in the center of His will. And less frequently I've made mention that there is the general will of God and there's also the specific will of God. The general will of God is simple. Read your Bible, pray, go to church, Give, live holy, witness to the lost. Every Christian should be doing at least this general will of God. How do we find the general will of God? It's found in the scriptures. Uh, Paul gives us what we ought to do as Christians. And then there is God's specific will for your life. This is something that God will reveal to you while you are doing the general will of God. And most Christians today, they, they can't even do the general will of God. And how do you expect God to reveal to you His specific will if you can't even do the little things that He expects of you? The problem with Christians is they can't never get past God's general will. And if you cannot get past general, God's general will, you'll never find out what God wants you to do. And the problem is that you have, uh, you have your plan. Your plan differs from God's plan. Your desires, they differ from God's desires. Your affections, they differ from God's affections. And the problem is, is that you love the world. And guess who hates the world? God does. There was a young man who was talking to a young woman in her early 20s. And a topic of marriage came up. And the young woman said, I'm not ready to settle down. I want to travel the world in the seven seas. I want to do these things. I want to live. I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to. But she does not know that 1 Timothy 5.14 5, says, I will therefore that the younger woman marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the advers adversary to speak reproachfully. Oh, you're so old-fashioned. I can hear the naysayers right now. What are you saying? Um, why do you want to put me, uh, give me, what do they say? Put me in the kitchen barefoot and pregnant? Is that what you want me to do? No, that's what God wants you to do. I don't want you to do that. That's what God wants you to do. I got news for you. Uh, this, what I just read for you, did not come from my imagination. It did not come from some novel that I wrote or some philosopher that I quoted. I simply read to you the Word of God. Oh, don't, are you taking that seriously? You better take it seriously because that's what God wants from you. And any young lady does not want this, does not have this desire. If I was a, a good, godly Christian young man, guess what? I would not want that young lady to be my wife if she does not have this desire here. When I met my wife, I didn't have to tell her what I wanted her to do. She told me what she wanted to do, and it aligned with the Scriptures. Her mind was made up. She was going to do what God told her to do. And this is the will of Him who made you. And if you dismiss it, 
You have issues, and the, your issues are not with me, they're with God. And the reason why so many of you are miserable is that you cannot, for whatever reason, submit to the will of God. I believe the general will of God is rather simple, <clears throat> and I say it general, and it's just a term we, we use. You're not going to find the general will of God, that phrase in the Bible, but you'll find the things that God expects from every one of you, and we all agree, if you've been a Christian long enough, that would you not agree that God wants you to read your Bible? Would you not agree that God wants you to pray? Would you not agree that God wants you to go to church? Would you not agree with me that God wants you to give of what He has already given you? Would you not agree with me that God wants you to live a holy life? And would you not agree with me that God wants you to listen to the law so they, they too may receive Christ as Savior? There was a bishop who lived over a century ago and he pronounced from the pulpit in, and in a periodical that he edited that heavier than air flight was not God's will. He says, if you're trying to fly and you're doing things contrary to the will of God, this was like over a hundred and some years ago, you know the irony of that man who said these things? You know who he was? He was Bishop Milton Wright. That bishop, that pastor, had two boys, Orville and Wilbur Wright. Isn't that ironic? Now why do I bring this up? What does this have to do with your message? He was not preaching God's will. Why was he saying that you can't fly? That it was not God's will to fly. It's like me saying, it's not God's will for us to send men to the moon. Who cares? If they want to go to the moon, let them go to the moon. Today we debate as whether we should eat this or drink that, and don't touch this, and you must not do such and such. In Christ, you know that you have liberty to do pretty much whatever you want? Great liberty in Christ. We are not bound by the law, because Christ had fulfilled the law, and we too in Him, because we are in Him and He is in us, we through Him have fulfilled the law, likewise. So He has freed us from the law. Technically, after you get saved, you're under no obligation to do anything. Technically speaking, that's what the Bible says. If you to be a, a technical about it, doctrinal about it. In Galatians 5.13, Paul says, For brethren, you have been called into liberty. Liberty, I can do pretty much what I want. I am saved. But, he says, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. That's the warning. Yeah, you can do pretty much whatever you want, but it won't end up well for you, because God requires us to do some things, not for our salvation, because He commands us to do these things. Romans 6, 14 and 15, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin, because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. God forbid. And the danger becomes that there are those who want to place you back under the law. And some take it a step further. They say you must keep the Sabbath. You must be circumcised. You must not eat pork and shrimp. You must, you must, you must. Now, if you do these things, you're free to do them. Now, if you want to worship God on a Monday, go ahead and <clears throat> worship on a Monday. If you want to eat mushrooms, go ahead and eat mushrooms. If you want to eat uh, beetles, go ahead and eat beetles. If you want to eat cricket powder like the, uh, the uh, New World Organization, uh, new, new, what's that health organization called? Uh, they're telling us to eat cricket powder because they don't want us to eat cows. If you want to eat that, go ahead. You're free to do so. In Christ, you have, you have the freedom to do these things. You want to drink muddy water? Go ahead, drink muddy water. It's, it's, you have the freedom to do that. But if you're going to keep the law, make sure you keep it all. I, I met some people and they, they pick and choose what parts of the law they want to keep. Uh, do you know under the law men were supposed to have full beards? You were not allowed to cut your beard off. If you're, living, if you're an Old Testament Jew, you had to, you had to have a full beard. Not only that, but on every, on every clothing you had, you had to have a, a fringe or a band of blue on the hems of your garments. I'm, I'm technically disobeying the law. If I was a law-abiding Jew, because my, my clothing doesn't have a, does not have a band of blue on its hems. That was the law. Three times in a year you had to show up in the temple. Three times in a year. And then you had to give tithes of all. And on and on and on. You can't just pick and choose the parts of the law you want to keep because they're convenient for you. And then you satisfy yourself saying, I am keeping the law. I am worshipping on a Saturday. I am, eat, I am abstaining from shellfish. I am abstaining from this. I am abstaining from that. 
Paul says, if you break one part of the law, you've broken it all. Why do I bring this up? Because there's a lot of cults out there that that's what they want to do. They want to put you into subjection. And I've warned you many times, we have standards. We have standards, why? Uh, to please God, not to keep you under the law, not to burden you, not to tell you you must do this or you must do that. We want to show people that we are God's people. We want to show the world that we are following God, so we have standards. But we have to be careful the moment you, you say, when you bring up a standard and you say, you must do this, you can cross the line and become a legalist. There's a, there's a cult out there called the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Uh, do you know that they teach that if you worship on a Sunday, you've taken the mark of the beast and you're going to go to hell? Whatever your friends say, it doesn't matter. That is their official position. They have taken an Old Testament command and they've twisted it. Uh, they've taken one Old Testament command and put in some New Testament verses. They shook it up and then they come up with their own doctrine. Paul, God warns us. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for the doctrines of the commandments of men. So when we, when we teach that God expects certain things from you, we are not trying to put you under the law. What we're trying to say is that God expects these things from you. Yes, in Christ you have the liberty and you can say, you know what, go pound sand, I'm going to do what I want. Well, that's, that's going to be between you and God in the end. We're Baptists and we believe in individual soul liberty. But as for me, I want to find out what God expects from me and do it. I want to be found in, at least in the general will of God. The general will of God is not something esoteric that requires some self-proclaimed guru to reveal to you. It's found in the pages of the scriptures. Don't, let, don't ever let anyone place you under such, uh, such bondage that you must do something that is not found in the scriptures. If, if, if the preacher or the pastor or the minister or the cult leader says you must do A, ask him, where is this found in the scriptures? I tell people I'm a biblicist first, a Baptist second. I go with what the Bible tells me. I call myself a Baptist, but in the end I believe the Bible. Years ago I heard a preacher give the following advice. He says, John 3.16 for the lost man and Hebrews 10.25 for the backslidden Christian. That's all you need to know. John 3.16 for the lost person. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3.16. That's all the lost person needs to know. And the backslidden Christian needs to know Hebrews 10.25. What is that? Let me read it to you. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. You see a backslidden Christian, uh, you're going to waste your time trying to get them to do right. If they can't get themselves in church, you're going you're to waste your time trying to get them to do right. If they can't take that step and come to church, I'm telling you, you're wasting your time. I've learned throughout the years that you cannot get a Christian to do right unless he or she starts coming to church. Why? Because that's how God has set it up. You want to grow? Come to church. Read your Bible and pray. That'll only take you so far. You have to come to church. Every single person who was, who was anointed to do a specific work for God in the New Testament was anointed out of what? The local church. When Paul and Barnabas uh, went out to do a work, what, how, did, how did they do it? Through the local church in Antioch. Every work, every person who's been called has been called through the local church. Every person that has done anything for God has done it through the local church. This is why I'm against these parachurch organizations. When I heard a, a young man call me up a year or so ago and he wanted to start an app, a Bible app for um, Bible-believing King James Independent Messages, I asked him, are you under any church? Are you doing this on your own accord? Oh, who's your pastor? Let me talk to your pastor. Are you under someone? Are you doing this through the local church? That's how God does things. He does things through the local church. I've heard people say, I don't need to go to church to be close to God. It doesn't matter what you think. I just read you what God expects from you. Hebrews 10.25 Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Not forsaking. That's God's command. I didn't make the rule. I don't make the rules. God makes the rules and I just tell you what the rules are. And if you don't like them, you, you can take them up with God. Deal with Him. And I think many of the reasons why uh, people don't go to church today because modern pastors have emasculated the people of God. I read an article where the author mentions that he was walking through the zoo one day and he described the condition of the gorillas in the zoo. And he says the following, As we walked through the ape house, 
The 400 pound gorillas looked so bored, so masculine, behind the protective plexiglass. And that's when a thought came across my mind, he said. I wonder if churches do that to people like zoos do to animals. He says, I don't think it's intentional. In fact, it's well intentioned, but I wonder if our attempts to help people sometimes hurt them. We try to remove the danger, remove the risk. We attempt to tame people in the name of Christ, forgetting that Jesus didn't die to keep us safe, that Jesus died to make us dangerous. You and I have to be a danger to the devil. When the devil sees you, you must cower and tremble. Why? Because inside you and I lives the living God. Paul says, Peter says, he has made us a partaker of the divine nature. The very nature of God lives inside us. So when I am in good standing with God, when I walk out there, guess who should tremble? The demons and the devil should tremble. But the problem is that today it's the other way around. We are the ones who tremble. We're afraid of the boogeyman out there. We're afraid to give someone a gospel trap. Matthew 10, 16, Jesus says, Behold, I sent you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. William Cowper said, Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon their knees. Uh, do your prayers make the devil tremble? Or do they make him yawn? Today, we are so afraid to call out sin in the chance that we may offend someone. I have never, it shouldn't be that way, brethren. Why are you afraid to call out someone's sin? Why are you afraid to tell them, brother, this is wrong, sister, that's not right? We're afraid to call them out because we don't want to offend them. You know what the problem is? We don't love them enough. Christ loved the people he came to serve and minister to, and he didn't pull any, any punches back. Let me share with you how we're supposed to treat those who spread falsehood in the body of Christ. In Titus chapter 1, verse 10 through 14, Paul, Paul tells Timothy, uh, sorry, he tells Titus, For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, whose, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not, for filthy lucre's sake. <clears throat> One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Cre Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies, this witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. You see that? You notice what Paul just said. Here. Rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Now what does rebuke sharply mean? Brother Jones, you know that what you're teaching is not exactly right. Maybe you should use different words. Uh, maybe you should use nicer words. Uh, you know the Bible says we have to be gentle. Does that sound like sharp rebuke to you? No. You're wrong. You're teaching heresy. Get into the word. You're sinning. Get back. Get right with God. We're afraid to do that. Why? Why are we afraid to do that? Because we're afraid of offending people. And throughout the years of our our, our pacifist Christianity, we become emasculated. We're like that 400 pound gorilla who's lost the zeal for life. What does a gorilla want to do? He wants to beat up another gorilla. Do you want to go up and fight the devil? That's what we're called to do for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against what? Spiritual wickedness, principalities. Paul gives a list, a laundry list of things that we fight. Do you think you're going to fight the devil by being nice to him? The only ones we ought to be gentle with is the flock of God. <coughs> but the wolves who try to subvert the flock of God, we should never hold back. That's why when I hear false doctrine, it just it rubs me the wrong way. It makes me angry. Because I know that guy who's trying to sell his book, trying to push his new doctrine, his new theory, that he's, he's going to deceive the, the, the people of God. And what is he going to make in return? A whole bunch of money. Remember, there was a story years ago about this young boy who said he went to heaven, and he came back, and he was telling everybody his story, and... Uh, they were selling books by the millions. This little boy went to heaven. Oh, did you hear? I even heard about it. But you know, it was all a scam. And when the boy came out and all he did, well, all he said was, I did this because I wanted attention. The publisher knew this. And you know that they didn't pull a book off the shelf because the book was selling like hotcakes. They were right. The Christians are willing to buy a book for 10, 15 dollars and read about a story about a boy who went to heaven that was all made up, but they won't spend five minutes in the Word of God. That's where we're at right now. 
There's a difference between swearing and using foul language versus sharp rebuke. Have you ever wondered, uh, not wondered, have you ever looked at what Christ called the Pharisees? Hypocrites, serpents, full of dead men's bones, whitewashed sepulchers, blind children of the devil, among other things. This is the meek little Jesus, and that's what he called the Pharisees? Why? Because he was preventing the people of God from finding him. Uh, the problem with many Christians is that no one has pointed the finger at them and said, uh, you're sinning by the way you live and you're doing a disservice to the name of Christ. You've got to call people out. You've got to do it in love, we understand, but you can't, you've you, you got to do it. You've got to do it. This morning, in a way, I want to point your finger and, and finger and say, aren't you concerned with finding what God's specific will for your life is? Have you ever taken thought and taken uh, inventory and said, uh, God, what would you have me do? Are you concerned? Does it bother you if you're serving God in His specific will for your life? Does it bother you? It bothers me. I want to be doing what God expects me. And if I don't, it really bothers me. This message this morning, as we come to the part B of it, we're going to have another hour of preaching, I'm just kidding, is geared to those Christians who have been doing the general will of God but want something more. They want something more. At this point, you may look at me and you say, uh, you're coming up with terms that are not found in the Bible. You're a heretic. Where do you tell me God says general will? I, I, I hopefully have prefaced the fact by saying that there is no such term as general will of God in the Bible. All I do is I read the Bible and I find out what God wants me to do and I do it. And I believe that's a general will of God. Now you say, well, well, where is the specific will of God? I'm glad you asked. Romans 12, 1 through 2. I beseech you, brethren... Uh, by the mercies of God that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice wholly acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service and be not conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable perfect will of God Romans chapter 1 uh, chapter 12 verse 1 and 2 tell me that God has a perfect will for my life and I believe that's apart from the separate uh, general will of God. Why? Because later on in that chapter, Paul says this. He explains to us what he means by the perfect will of God. He says in verse 4, for, for we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. Having then gifts differing to the grace that is given to us. Paul begins by saying, my job as a Christian is to present my body a living sacrifice before God. You know what a living sacrifice is? Lord, do with me as you will. And Paul says when you do that, when you, are not, when you transform yourself by the renewing of your mind, which happens on a daily basis, then God is going to reveal to you the gift that He has given to you, the talent that He has given to you, and what He expects you to do in His church. I believe God, and I don't believe it too, the Bible teaches that God has imparted to every one of His children a talent, a gift, or sometimes several gifts, that you may operate these gifts in the local church. Do you know what your gift is? Do you, want to know, do you know what God has called you to do? This principle is undeniable. God has given us gifts. Romans 12.6, 1 Corinthians 12.11, 1 Peter 4.10. But all these work if that one in the same self, self same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will, individually as he will. The Holy Spirit has given you a gift. Before, uh, 1 Peter 4.10, as every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. God has given you gifts. And what have you done with the gift that God has given you? Do you even know what gift God has given you? Some Christians have a gift and they, all they do is they, they sit on it. They put their gift to sleep. They hide their gift under a bushel. Some have cryogenically frozen it to come back at some later time in the future when technology is better. Uh, some of you have sent your gift into deep space. Some of you have locked it up in Fort Knox, never to be found. Hidden, amid, hidden in the midst of all that gold. So if you and I believe that God has a specific will for our lives, and that it is His desire to fulfill this, His purpose in our lives, then why do so many Christians struggle to find this purpose? Why do so many Christians, why are so many Christians, I should say, unaware of what their spiritual gift is. I don't want to rehash God's general will, but I hope and pray that all of you are endeavoring to at least 
fulfill the general will of God. And I believe as you do that, God will reveal to you what He expects from you, what He wants from you. And I believe that's why part of the body of Christ is hurting today, because there are so many Christians who have been given talents and gifts, and they're just hiding them. They, they've just put them, to, they've just, they're just hibernating. And I believe part of the reason is, there's many reasons, but one of the reasons why Christians have a hard time with this is the uncertainty. There's uncertainty in letting go and letting God. We're afraid to let go because we, we want to control our lives. We want to control every, uh, every aspect of our lives. When God reveals His plan to us, He's going to do it piecemeal. Uh, when God revealed His will to Paul, the first thing He told him is, go to Ananias. And He's going to tell you what to do. Paul did not know what God wanted him fully at the beginning. And that's the way God does it. He does this so that we can learn to trust Him. And this is hard for many people because they cannot let go. Uh, for those of you who feel you have to be in control, it will almost be impossible for you. It's not easy to fulfill God's plan if you feel you have to be in control. If the Lord Jesus Christ struggled with fulfilling God's plan, that He died on the cross... Don't expect it to be easier for you. If the Son of God Himself struggled with God's will, and He was God in the flesh, do you think you're going to have an easier time with it? When Paul was preaching the gospel in Ephesus, he described his battles as having to fight off beasts. That the moment you endeavor to pursue a higher calling, you will be met with opposition. The devil will fight you. Sometimes those closest to you will fight you. And your flesh will definitely fight you. And as you learn to love God more, I believe that uh, the desire to do His will will grow in you. It's a natural development of spiritual growth. God did not save us to put us on a shelf. God saved us to do something for Him. God saved us so that we may be holy, that we might do something great for Him. Resting in the flesh, resisting the flesh is painful. Now the best way I can describe it is someone going through through withdrawal, an added going through withdrawal, it's pretty hard. Hebrews 2.18 says, For in that he himself hath suffered, being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Christ suffered in the flesh. He suffered in the flesh. If you have our time understanding what I mean, that you're going to have to struggle with the flesh, you're going to suffer in the flesh, I'm going to give you some, some, some things to think about. I'm going to share with you how you'll know that your flesh will fight you. And your flesh is always fighting you. So take a handful of gospel tracts and go out starting knocking on some doors. Sounds easy, right? But do you think you can do it? Do you think you can take a bunch of gospel tracts and start knocking on some doors and start passing them up? Say, I'd like to give you something to eat. Can I share Christ with you? Can I invite you to church? Second, uh, go to the center of town and walk up to a stranger and say, Hey, can I tell you about Jesus? Sounds easy, right? Uh, when's the last time you fasted for someone's soul? Uh, instead of going on vacation, take that money you saved up and send it to your favorite missionary. If you can say, I can do all these things and I have no problem doing all these things, then perhaps you've obtained victory over your flesh. But if you can't do these things... I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to point out is that you have not gained victory over your flesh. But if you're honest with me and say, Pastor, I cannot bring myself to do any of these things. You know why you can't? Because you have not received victory over your flesh. Your flesh still controls you and you think you're okay. That's where the rubber meets the road. And that's why I don't judge a person's salvation by what they do or do not do or what they're willing to do for Christ because I just gave you a simple list over here. 90% of Christians cannot follow one of these things that I gave you on the list. They cannot bring themselves to do these things because they have not received or gained victory over the flesh. The hardest, one of the hardest things I remember doing for God was praying publicly. I was 16 years of age, I was in a Bible study and I was determined to pray. I was determined to pray. As they went around and as it was getting closer for my turn to pray, I soaked my t-shirt. I was determined I was going to pray. My flesh did not want to pray. I was terrified. I was shaking. I was nervous. I broke it into a profuse sweat. But I was determined I was going to pray. 
The next hardest thing was passing out gospel tract. I did it anyways. Another harder thing was preaching on the street. I got the nerve to do that. Why? Because I was determined to do what God wanted me to do. But one of the things I, the, one, of, one of the hardest things I ever did is knock on someone's door and give them a gospel tract. I was seven years old when I did that. My mother made me do it. She said, I want you to go climb those stairs. I want you to knock that door. And I want you to give that person a gospel tract. I was terrified. I went up those stairs as fast as I could go, knocked on the door. When that person opened the door, I gave him the gospel track. The moment that person took the track, I ran down those stairs so fast, Superman couldn't catch up to me. I was seven years of age. I was terrified, but I was going to do it. My mom told me to do it, and I knew it was the right thing to do it. Uh, the first time I was asked to preach, I had no idea what I was doing. I was terrified of public speaking. Even today, when I get up and I, and I teach or preach, I'm nervous. Because my flesh doesn't want to do it. Even to this day, my flesh does not want to do it. But I, I want to do what the Lord wants me to do. And the biggest hindrance you're going to have in carrying out God's will is going to be you. It's going to be you. The devil will try to stop you. Your family will try to stop you. But the biggest problem is right there. That's the problem. Internally, there's going to be a war. And there is a war between your spirit and the flesh. Our flesh will often feel like a victim. It will fight, it will lust, it will rebel, it will protect itself from any perceived pain. Your flesh will protect itself from any perceived embarrassment. The flesh wants to be pampered and provided with perks. And some, um, uh, for some of us, any inconvenience will be met with stiff resistance. The flesh says, uh, you're not going to do that. Uh-uh. You're not going to pass our gospel track. Uh-uh. You're not going to knock on a door. No way, Jose. I'm not going to let you do that. God gives you an opportunity to witness to someone. You get locked up. You freeze. Your flesh says, oh no, you won't. You're not going to bring up the name of Christ. I'm not going to let you. The only way we can accomplish God's will is if we remove the flesh out of the way. And you can only do that through the power of the Spirit. When Christ was faced with a cross, he had to fight with his flesh. If the Son of God had a hard time with God's will, do you think it'll be any easier for you? It's not. It won't be easy. Mark 14, 35 says that he went forward a little and he fell on the ground. He fell on the ground. The Lord Jesus Christ fell on the ground as he was struggling with the thought of getting on the cross. Luke, being a medical doctor, added this telling detail. In verse 44 of Luke chapter 22, Luke adds and he says, And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. God in the flesh was in agony over what he was about to face. Yes, we can argue it was not an easy task, but we, we, but we ourselves struggle even with the mundane. Some of you cannot even open your Bibles. Some of you uh, don't even know how to pray. And there are those who have never led a lost sinner to the Lord. God knows how hard it is for us to do these things. He does. He knows it's not easy. Medical experts tell us that Jesus Christ experienced hematohydrosis, which is a Greek word meaning blood and, and, uh, and sweat. Hematohydrosis. While he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. All the medical terms are Greek words. And they charge a lot of money to learn those medical terms so you can get a job and charge people a lot of money to tell them what they have in Greek medical terms. It's just a, it's sometimes I think it's just a big racket. But sometimes we get sick, we, we're glad we have a doctor. Isn't that true? Uh, they say that this condition, it's very rare. Uh, it's called sweating blood. And it is known to be precipitated by stress, strain, and extreme exertion. Our Lord Jesus Christ was so distressed, so stressed with what he had to do that he started sweating drops of blood. That's how much he struggled with doing God's will. Yes, we may argue the fact that getting on a cross is no easy task. But the point is, just as he struggled, so will we. He, would, he struggled to tell us, yes, you're going to struggle. But you know what? You can do it. You can do it. And how did Jesus overcome this struggle? He prayed. He didn't pray once. He, prayed, he didn't pray twice. He prayed three times. Until the end, he was ready to fulfill his destiny. Do you know who does not record the struggle of Christ? The Apostle of John. 
because John portrays Jesus as God. In his divine nature, there was no struggle. It was in his, in his humanity that he struggled. Your flesh is naturally opposed to God, to his loss, to anything that is righteous. When you, en when you watch, when you enjoy the world's music, the world's entertainment, and you know who's enjoying it? Not you, it's your flesh that's enjoying it. It's your flesh that is enjoying it, not your spirit. We are prisoners of our own flesh. The flesh doesn't want to go to heaven. It wants to keep living. It is your spirit that wants to join Christ. And once you allow the spirit to control you, guess what you'll want? You'll want to go to heaven. Not tomorrow, but now. When you're controlled by the Spirit, you'll want to go to heaven now. You'll want to be with Jesus now. Do you rejoice at the fact, at the thought of meeting of the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you rejoice at that or do you shudder or are afraid of it? In Romans chapter 7, Paul makes the case that deep within himself, he wishes to do what God's law defines as good, but he finds something else within himself that opposes everything that is good. He says he desires to conform to God's laws. He desires to crucify the flesh with its affections. But there's something else that's fighting him. Your flesh is going to fight you. Your flesh is going to fight you. Jesus says in Matthew 26, 41, Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. When Christ was praying, what did he do? He also requested that his disciples pray with him. He was in such agony, he says, could you pray with me? Could you please pray with me? But they, what, did, what did he find them doing instead of praying? They were sleeping. The disciples' spirits were willing to do what was right, but their flesh couldn't. Their flesh put them to sleep. Few minutes earlier, before they went into the Garden of Gethsemane, every single one of them pledged loyalty to Christ to the point of death. Their spirit was willing, but when time came, when the rubber met the road, they all fell asleep. The spirit of the believer is willing to follow God, but the flesh is weak, and Satan uses the weakness to tie us up, to hold us back, to slow us down, and to keep us distracted. In Exodus 17, the Amalekites came to fight the children of Israel. And then Moses says to Joshua, Grab it, gather a whole bunch of men and go fight against the Amalekites. Amalek is a type of the flesh, and the flesh is in rebellion against God and the things of God. And when the Israelites were, were fighting, Moses lifted up his hands. And then Moses got tired, he, he put his hands down. And the moment he put his hands down, the Bible says the Amalekites prevailed. And then they quickly, they quickly caught on that when Moses had his hands up, they win. So then Aaron and Hur took each one of, each one took an arm and lifted it up, and they kept Moses' hands up all the way until every last Amalekite was defeated. This to us is a picture of how we are supposed to fight the flesh. We're supposed to pray, pray, pray. The moment you quit praying, the moment you quit praying, the moment you get tired of praying, the moment you get tired of doing the things of God, what happens? The flesh is going to win. The flesh is going to defeat you. And what else do we learn from this lesson? Even, even with Christ, we need others to pray alongside us. You pray, you keep praying, and if you can't pray, uh, get some help. Say, can you pray for me? Can you pray for someone's salvation? Can you pray for this? Can you pray for that? I don't understand why so many Christians keep the struggles to themselves. They keep it internally. We are supposed to share one another's burdens. We are supposed to help each other carry our burdens. Pray for one another. Is not that what the Bible says? So why do you keep your burdens to yourself? You know who wants you to do that? The devil wants you to do that. Because the moment others start praying for you, uh, he's going to lose power over you. Jesus did not keep his agony to himself. He shared it with his disciples. Think about that. The Son of God showing himself weak to his disciples, saying, look, I am distressed. I'm going to face this. Can you please pray for me? If the Son of God required prayer or desired prayer for his, from his disciples, how much more you and I? You're struggling with something. Share, share the burden so we can pray for you. You're not, you and I need to cooperate with the Lord by exercising a spirit unto prayer that we may put the flesh to death in order that we may accomplish God's will in our lives. And we are to keep praying until the very last Amalekite has been slain. Pray until spiritual victory is won, however long it takes. Pray until your flesh cries uncle. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, for this message. We pray you strengthen us through it. We pray, God, that we can learn from our Lord. We can learn that the struggles of the flesh are real, Lord. If he struggled, how much more are we? How much more shall we struggle? And help us, Lord God, not to see our struggles and not to uh, think of defeat when we struggle, but to know that there is victory through those struggles as we pray through them. And help us, Lord God, to share our burdens with one another so that we can pray, so that we can receive this victory if we have not received it as of yet. Pray, God, that you strengthen your people this morning and you help us, Lord, be revived as we sang earlier this morning. Revive us, O Lord God, that we may do your will, that we may be true ambassadors for Christ and not secret service, secret service agents, that people may know who we, who we believe, what we stand for, that there's no ambiguity, that they know that when they see us, he's a Christian, she's a Christian. Help us, Lord God, to stand tall for Christ and to fight this flesh so that we may fulfill your will in our lives. Give us the strength to do that, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray.